Hey, it's Norm from Tessa.com. I'm here in New York City's Chinatown. It doesn't look like a Chinese restaurant I've ever been to, but it's a laboratory. I'm here with David Arnold. What just happened? This is a, a puffing gun. This one is actually used on uh, street corners in, in Asia today to make uh, puff snacks. Ready? Puffing is one of the first technologies that really brought breakfast cereal the, um, in an American way, ready to eat breakfast cereal. The two technologies were flaking and puffing. Well, let's start at the beginning. You right. puffing guns a century ago, 1900s, this technology was invented. How does it work? So there's a, a scientist named Anderson who was working on starch, and he was heating starch inside of starch grains and granules and flowers inside of test tubes to high pressures. And he would break the test tube, and he noticed when he shattered the test tube that poof, it would puff like this. Right? And so the concept is, instead of having the skin on, let's say, popcorn contain the pressure, you have an artificial thing that contains all the pressure, and then when you break the pressure, everything inside expands uniformly and instantly because the water vaporizes. As so you're just stuffing rice and corn inside containers, heating it up to very high temperatures? Well, they, 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 everything depends. So what happens is, is that higher the temperature, the more brown things get. So, you know, these are actual, uh, if you look at this, this one's going to be white on the inside, but sometimes if you heat it too much, it actually gets brown all the way through. Meyer reactions can actually happen all the way through because the whole thing's being heated to very high temperatures. The higher you heat it, right, uh, the more water can evaporate when it, more it can expand because there's extra energy. And so the kind of more expansion you get. The less you heat it, the lower the pressure, and the lower the heat, the less the expansion. And so that's one of the variables. I mean, the problem with, with this kind of gun is it's very hard to isolate any one of the right. variables. The, the way all of these kind of manual batch style guns work is you're monitoring, you apply heat, and you regulate it, and then you just look at the pressure, right? And so what you're counting on is that a small amount of liquid on the inside of your grain or whatever. In fact, you can do Cheerios, you can do Fruit Loops in this, you can do anything like that. Kicks can be done here. Um, you're monitoring the pressure, and a small amount of the liquid that's inside of this will volatilize, will boil off, and form the pressure that's on the inside of the vessel. The rest of the moisture is used at the very high temperature to gelatinize the starch, make it plastic, mm -hmm. right? Then when you release the pressure, uh, the problem is, is that if you have any leaks, there's, there's no margin for error with the moisture. Yeah. So if there's any leaks in it, extra moisture keeps coming out, and then all of a sudden, okay, there's not enough left to pressurize the vessel, there's not enough left to expand, the temperatures go very high, and it burns. So the very first uh, demo we saw, that was with rice, it's something you know works. Yeah, no you works. You know how much moisture is in that rice, you know what pressure, right, you're up to 100. Uh, right? Yeah, so we cut it off at 100, we fired about 120. Right, and then so that's going to create something like Rice Krispie-like. Well, it's not right, it's more like a Quaker, so Quaker was the, was the original people who owned this patent. Mm -hmm. um, they bought it from Anderson and started firing rice. So you notice, unlike a Rice Krispie, which is an extruded dough product, this is actually the whole grain extruded right. and if I took this into the big gun and fired at an extra 10 psi higher it would be even more but the problem is uh, the more you expand something the more like styrofoam it tastes so you're trying to actually adjust the I try to I'm trying to adjust the expansion down most of the time because otherwise it's like packing peanuts and then the reason we have everything here is because you're also experimenting with grains and that you haven't with Right, so you know this is like a like this is a pseudo grain. I don't know if I have any left that haven't been puffed yet. Called uh, Job's Tears. The pressure kind of went higher than I thought because we had a the temperature we had a leak in the gun. We, one of the issues with this gun is it is it's designed for street corner use, which means it's kind of all being turned by hand, and you're very close to it when it's working. But it also has no safeties on it. And so I won't run a device with no safeties. So when we installed all the safeties and the motors and everything like this. We made it such that uh, the disjoint uh, got a little too hot, and also the way that they intended to screw it, it unscrews itself if it, a, a, as the sealant <laughs> not, came off. Not safe at all. Not and safe at all. This is something that people put between their legs in Asia and still make this type of edible content yeah. on the streets. I mean, I'm, I'm, I haven't read of any cases of people dying yet, but you know, there's no data that this thing's been hydrostatically... T Look, if you're going to make this thing in the U.S., in fact, the one we have, right? you would hydrostatically test the unit for rupturing. So when you do a hydro test, and I have a hydro test, hold on a sec. These are like uh, whipped cream chargers. Mm -hmm. uh, made, the company EC makes these, and uh, they hydro test and then explosively test, right? 
So you want the you want the manufacturer to hydro test in a kind of a low energy. So there's water on the outside, water on the inside. Since water doesn't um, compress, there's very little extra energy stored above mm -hmm. the pressure. So you know you get these little ruptures here, even at mega pressures. Whereas if you don't hydro and you know there's a, a fault, then you get this sort of yeah. failure mechanism, which is why and cast iron is very brittle, which is why you know hence the holy oh shit. <laughs> So, so the big puffing gun, the one you have in the back, 3,200 pounds, it's for the Museum of Food and Drink, which is something you were trying to establish, set up in New York City. And that's going to be an exhibit, so people can walk in and theoretically and, and see this huge machine puff all sorts of different grains? Right, we did a Kickstarter and uh, raised over $100,000, built the, the cage for it, also you know, very safe, engineers, the whole, whole nine. And we, we took it to an event on the street and fired it all day. But uh, even more important than the flavor was showing people, we got to show people science, we got to show people history, uh, and it's really cool, it's huge, it's so loud. When you're firing off 18 pounds of rice at, you know, we're firing at like 120 PSI, and the, with that one, the stick that you use to fire it is a giant rod that weighs like 15, 20 pounds. Just boom, and it's knocking, it's just boom. So it's great to fire. But the reason you have this shipped over from Asia here, it's experiment, and so you're interested in this from a culinary perspective because you want to see this used, you know, maybe as a commercial product, pre commercial products, or in kitchens, right? It's been around for a hundred years, but when was the last time someone seriously played with it? This technology has been superseded, and because the technology has been superseded, there's not a lot of people fooling around with it right now. So everyone's kind of doing the same old, same old stuff. And you know, once we can get this thing such that it's easier to operate and we can run you know, 30, 40 batches in a row instead of two or three before we develop a problem with it, uh, you know, then we can really start experimenting on, um, on some. Also, like, let's say we want to try something that's really expensive. Mm -hmm. The optimum batch size for the other thing, really anything below about five pounds, five, six pounds, mm -hmm. no, because remember, you're dealing, with the, you're dealing with the inherent moisture on the inside of the grain to uh, volatilize. So then if you don't have the optimum batch size, you need to add extra moisture. If you add so that to make up for it, if you add too much moisture, it tends to over plasticize, and then you'll see that the grains kind of stick together and things get torn apart. And there's all sorts of problems. You know, when we started doing it for the museum, you become fascinated with something, and then so for 300 bucks, you're, you know, you can get a device that'll let you do it. Obviously, I'm going to do it. Right. And don't try this at home, even though you can buy it online for 300 bucks. You got to build a pretty strong protective. Yeah, page. I mean, look, honestly, when it came. We were shocked. We were completely shocked that someone would send me a device in a box. First of all, the box was all kicked to hell. Like I say, not hydro tested at all. Like, you know, like nothing, nothing, nothing says safety about it. There's not one, there's not one scrap of good feeling about it when it showed up. And so, you know, the very first thing we did was um, put a pressure release on it. Didn't have an unbelievable, no pressure release. You know what I mean? Unbelievable, because if your gauge fails yep. and you don't know what the pressure is, or I don't know, you fall over, or whatever, and you can't unhinge it, and you have heat on, imagine building up the pressure inside of that thing—it's catastrophic, horrible. You know, we had to be hand spun, nightmare. I don't want to sit there and spin this thing by hand, complete nightmare. You know, I want to be protected by that by this. The real puffing gun has clutch system, so that when the door flies open, it doesn't smash against things. Uh, it works much more like a vice grip with a cam, so it you know it locks mm -hmm. over and holds on very well. It's not like this sort of thing. Like it unscrews itself. It either unscrews this or unscrews that when it's spinning, depending on what. I mean, it's complete. It, it yeah. Nightmare from it a is. safety standpoint, and well, from a, and therefore, I mean, look, this would be easy for me to fire if I was willing to hold it down here and uh, like fire it up like you know with your face over it, and then you know what I mean, but. Who the hell is going to do that? Well, it's all in the name of food science and doing something interesting with something that people have been using, still used today. And if people want to see the big puffing gun, where, where can they find that? Well, so we, we're now redesigning that exhibit. Anything, anything like this, it, you know, there's a learning curve to it. And you know, it took us maybe on the big gun, maybe 20 shots before we were really good at it. And we're really good at the big gun. We know how to, how to make that thing work. But the problem is, is that you were taking delivery of the gun 
and we don't know all the parameters. So now the exhibit, we ran it once, but we're going to make it a little more streamlined. Uh, and then we hope to do things like take it to schools and you know teach, teach kids um, kind of the science behind uh, how breakfast cereals are made uh, and the history of it. Because the, the history, history of it and the cultural implications of cereal are amazing. I mean, the arc cereal, breakfast cereal, has an arc you know, as good as any movie character does. You know, starting out as a health food by uh, you know, kind of extremely religious people with some strange beliefs about the you know, human mind and body. Like you shouldn't enjoy anything. Literally it was made as a product that you're just maximum digestion and minimum pleasure. Like pleasure bad. You know and what then I mean? they figured out you could add sugar to it. Right, and market it and, yeah. you know, and, it, and it's a really an interesting case study in uh, after the television age started of uh, marketing shifting towards children. Right, because then it's like you know, it's not marketed any like at the parents to buy it anymore. It's marketed at the kids to force their parents to buy it. So then you have the premiums, and you have I mean, it's it's just an amazing, amazing history. And there's a lot of science involved too. I mean, we don't go hyper in depth, but the science is, is fairly interesting. Um, you know, behind puffing and figuring out how much things are going to puff and, and how they work. And everyone understands that when you make the analogy to popcorn and how popcorn works. Um, but yeah, so it's it's. It's, it's a tool that lets you teach many things at the same time. And have some dangerous fun. Yeah, right. Blow things up. Everyone likes to blow things Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Love that. Well, thank you, David, so much. Uh, this probably won't be in the public, but that big puffing gun, maybe at the Museum of Food and Drink when you guys find a place for that. Yeah, and even before we find a place, you know, keep an eye out. We, we, it's, it's, we built it on a trailer so we can move it. So we hope to, once we get all the kinks worked out, to take it maybe to other cities and to take it to other venues within New York. So maybe coming soon to a city near you. Awesome. Just make sure you bring your earplugs when you check that out. I'm Norm from Tessa. Thank you again, David. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Norm.